So in our discussion of the heart, so far we've looked at the anatomy of the heart. We've looked at the conduction mechanisms of the heart from the point of the sinoatrial node initiating a heartbeat to the conduction through the atrial muscles down to the ventricles. We've talked just a bit about what controls the rate of the heart. We'll get into more detail about that. But here we're going to consider the cardiac cycle. This is, this is your heartbeat. And the heart is going to beat about once every eight tenths of a second. Now, if you average that out over a minute for a typical patient, you're going to be running about 72 to 75 beats a minute on average. And these eight tenths of a second are going to be divided into two major stages. The first is going to be systole. Now, when you see the word systole with no other clarifying word, know that that's ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. If they're talking about atrial systole, they will put atrial in front of that word. So in this case, it takes three tenths of a second for the heart to complete the contraction of both ventricles happening at the same time. That then leads into half a second of relaxation. And again, this is we're talking about ventricular relaxation and we call it diastole. Again, you don't see atrial, so diastole alone is referring to the relaxation of the ventricles. Now you also see on this slide atrial systole. Now that's in the final tenth of a second that's occurring at the end of diastole. It's not in addition to. But the last tenth of a second of diastole, the atrium is going to contract. And we're going to see that's going to add that last 20% volume of blood to the ventricles just before we re-enter the cycle with ventricular contraction. So that's sort of an overview and a complete shot of our cardiac cycle. Now, putting this into graphical form, what we're going to see is it looks a lot like this. And this is basically our cardiac cycle in a graphical view. We have systole, our three-tenths of a second, it shows you ventricle, uh, ventricles contracting. On the inside, it's showing you what the atria are doing here. And where you see the dashed line, that is going to be the end of systole and the beginning of diastole that lasts for that half a second, these outer dashed lines. But you see on the inside, you see the atria contract. That's that last tenth of a second there in ventricular diastole, the atria are also undergoing atrial systole to contract before the ventricles start the cycle all over again. Now again, this is a simplified version and you know that I personally love graphics that have a lot of information to help us remember more material. This is my version and we're going to go through each of these five stages of systole and diastole. We've broken them down further and we're going to see what these letters and numbers mean and we'll review this at the end. So we're going to start at the top. The first stage or first subset of systole is going to be isovolumetric contraction. Now isovolumetric along with the word contraction kind of doesn't make sense because contraction basically means you're having a smaller space. And if you're having a smaller space, how can you have the same volume? Isovolumetric meaning same volume. Well, in this case, we're referring to the amount of blood that's in each one of the ventricles. So this is the very beginning of our ventricular contraction. Now we're starting with the ventricles completely filled with blood. And that blood is really under very little pressure, if any. But as we start to constrict, contract the ventricles, that pressure is going to begin to increase. And as the pressure slowly increases, blood is going to try to move upward. And the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to reach a pressure where we push the atrioventricular valves, 
That's both of them, the tricuspid and bicuspid. Push them closed because there's no pressure in the atria. They're completely empty. And that closure at low pressure is going to create that S1, the first heart sound, and that's the lub sound. But we haven't created enough pressure in this just initial part of systole to push open the semilunar valves that were, were closed at the beginning. Because when you think of blood pressure, a typical blood pressure is 120 over 80. 120 is the number representing your systolic pressure, and 80 is the number representing your diastolic. Well, in this stage, we just finished diastole, and the blood in our aorta and pulmonary trunk is still at 80 millimeters of mercury, pushing, pushing those semilunar valves and keeping them closed. The blood in the ventricles have to exceed that 80 millimeters of mercury before blood can move out of the ventricles into those great vessels and open the semilunar valves. So since we are not at 80, we're lower than 80, then the valves remain closed. We've just closed the AV valves. There's nowhere for the blood to go yet. So the net movement of blood is zero. So that's isovolumetric. No blood has left yet. And that's the first stage of systole. But as the muscular walls of the ventricle continue to contract, that's going to increase the pressure well beyond 80. And that's going to lead to the ejection of the blood in both ventricles into their respective great vessel, the aorta and pulmonary trunk. And that blood is going to push open the semilunar valves and just push them against the walls of those vessels. And as the heart continues to contract, its maximal contraction is going to confer that highest pressure. Again, textbook, that's going to be 120 millimeters of mercury. Whatever your systolic pressure is, that is that number that's pushing the blood out of your ventricles. Now, at rest, when you're sitting in this class or you're sitting listening to this recording, you're only ejecting two-thirds or roughly 60 to 66% of the blood that's in the ventricles. And that amount of blood is called the stroke volume. About a third of the blood that was in the ventricles remains in the ventricles at the end of contraction. And that's referred to as your end systolic volume. Now, as you become more active and as your body demands more blood and more oxygen, that number can decrease slightly. And so this think of this as almost a reserve with which your body can use more of the blood in the ventricles in cases of emergency. But again, under normal conditions, two-thirds of the blood in your ventricles is ejected per beat, and that's called your stroke volume. Now, this ends systole, and at the end of systole, we've ejected all of the blood. There's no blood in the ventricles, and now we enter the first portion of diastole or relaxation. So here, with no blood in the ventricles, we are basically lowering past 80 millimeters of mercury. Eventually, we'll get down to a flat zero millimeters of mercury, which is no pressure, basically a vacuum. But once we hit 80 millimeters of mercury and get lower, now the blood in the great vesicles, the vessels are under more pressure. They're going to push to return to the ventricles, and that's going to fill those pockets of the semilunar valves, and that's going to close those valves, each one, the pulmonary as well as the aortic semilunar valves. And that creates the second sound, S2 of our heartbeat, the dub sound. And that's because the blood is trying to move backwards. As the ventricles expand, the pressure decreases, and the blood tries to move backwards. But it's prevented from doing so because of those semilunar valves. Now, the pressure is continuing to drop. It, we still have pressure. We, has, we haven't reached zero yet. And during this isovolumetric relaxation period, the atria begin to fill with blood, the blood returning back from the body and from the lungs. But the blood in the atria still is not under a high enough pressure than we have in the ventricles. So initially, it just stays 
in the atria while we're going through this isovolumetric relaxation. Now, even though we're filling the atria with blood, the isovolumetric portion of this stage, just like in stage one, refers to the blood in the ventricles. So there's no change in the blood volume of the blood in the ventricles. It's still our end systolic volume. You can see it in that abbreviation ESV. That volume is not changing during this period. But as the heart, the ventricles continue to expand and relax, as the pressure lowers, we will get to a point that the blood in the atria is now under more pressure than the pressure we have in the ventricles, and that will cause the blood to fall or drop or be sucked into the ventricles. And 80% of the volume that's finally going to be in the ventricles is sucked down into the ventricles very quickly, and we call this the rapid filling stage of diastole. Now, this is the last ventricular stage of diastole, but recall in the last tenth of a second of ventricular diastole, we're going to have the atria do something, and this remember, they still have that 20% of that volume is still in the atria. We need to get that to the ventricles before we start the cycle again and lead to contraction. So in the last tenth of a second of ventricular diastole, the atria contract. This is atrial systole. And that's going to force the final volume of blood down into the ventricle. And this full 100% portion is called the end diastolic volume, or EDV. And we're hitting this just before we start systole all over again. Now, the amount of blood that we have in the ventricles, this end diastolic volume, this is considered the preload force. This is how much force has to be exerted by the heart to move that volume of blood out and into the great vessels. So you can think of this volume of blood sitting in the ventricles as the weights you put on your barbell that you now have to lift. This is the preload force. We're going to see a factor that affects how, how much blood is, is moved throughout the body. It's called afterload. We're, we're going to see that in a bit. But for now, this is our preload, and this is the end diastolic volume. So to summarize all this, let's go back now to our graphic with the abbreviations. The red that you see, these are the stages of systole, the isovolumetric contraction, stage two ejection. This is showing you the pressure in the ventricle of each. This is showing you that the S1 sound is made by those atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid. And then the ejection phase, this is, the, maybe you could make this 180 to 120. We're getting over 180 and we're going to our maximum in the ventricles. And that's going to force that pressure to go maximum in our vessels as well. And that 60% that's trying to represent the two thirds that's ejected. Over in the blue, that's going to be our diastole, isovolumetric relaxation number three, rapid filling number four. This is showing you that we're dropping below 80 millimeters of mercury in the ventricles, going down to practically zero. That's going to cause the semilunar valves to close, creating the S2 sound. And as this pressure continues to drop, that's going to allow the blood that filled in the atria here in this stage three to rapidly fill the ventricles in stage four. That's going to get 80% of that final volume. The last 20% comes in this last tenth of a second in gold, and that is our atrial systole, the very last portion of diastole before we start the cycle all over again. So hopefully you will find this graphic useful in your studies about the cardiac cycle. So we said stroke volume. 
that two thirds that's ejected from the ventricles every beat. That stroke volume is the amount of blood that's moved per beat. Well, if you look at how much blood is moved per minute, that is called cardiac output. And it's a very effective means with which you can learn about how healthy your heart is and its capacity to move blood. And in fact, your cardiac output is determined by two factors. First, your heart rate. Because I think you can understand, if you want to move more blood, beat faster. Have more cardiac cycles per minute, you're going to move more blood. This one may not be as intuitive, but you can increase the stroke volume, how much blood you have in the heart, or how much blood you eject from the heart per beat. And there are another factors that can account for these changes in stroke volume. And we're going to talk about each of these as we go through the next portion of our time today. So these are all the factors you see over on the left hand side. Chronotropic agents. Chronotropic refers to time. Your watch is called a chronograph. And there are various means with which you can increase or decrease heart rate. And you can see that that does affect cardiac output. And then we're going to talk about those factors next that affect stroke volume. But first, let's look at our chronotropic with our heart beat. And with that, we're going to have some, some positive agents, which certainly the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase the rate of your heart. That's going to be your norepinephrine. We know that epinephrine can do that as well. But we have some other agents that can. Caffeine. I know many of you are addicted to caffeine. Nicotine, cocaine, these opiates, and even thyroid hormone that, it, that increases your metabolism. Those increase your heart rate, and so they're positively chronotropic. Versus the parasympathetic nervous system, again, parasympathetic is rest and digest. This, this portion of the autonomic nervous system releases acetylcholine and that is going to cause a slowing of your heart rate. And the way this works is the impact that these agents have on our pacemaker potential. If you look at the top graph, these, this is showing you the depolarization and the action potential happening in our SA node cells. They call them nodal cells, but it's the SA node. And recall that we've got our depolarization, repolarization. But in this hyperpolarization period, we have our HCN channels that give rise to our pacemaker potential. Now, this is the slope of a normal individual at rest. And that's at 75 beats a minute. And with that slope of the pacemaker potential, you can see how many beats we have in this period of time. But under parasympathetic control in acetylcholine, you can see the slope of the pacemaker potential is much flatter. That extends our cardiac cycles, and that's going to reduce the heart rate. Under sympathetic control, or some of the artificial drugs that we have, that's going to increase the slope of our pacemaker potential. Therefore, we're going to have more cycles per time frame, and that's going to be how our heart increases its rate and therefore increase our cardiac cycle. Now we turn our attention to stroke volume, and this is not as intuitive as, as we have with time and rate. But we're going to mostly look at venous return, and the more blood you return to the heart from the body, that's going to directly correlate to more blood you pump out. Whereas this afterload force, which has to do with our, our venous or our vessel resistance, whether it's venous in the pulmonary trunk or it's arterial in the aorta, that resistance is going to have an inverse effect on that stroke volume. It's much easier to move fluid through a big, huge pipe than it would be through a small diameter straw. And that's, in effect, what we're talking about with this afterload resistance. So in effect, with venous return, the more blood you return to the heart, the more blood you are going to eject from the heart. Now, this is going to affect that preload force 
that that 100% of blood at the end of diastole, in diastolic volume, that's your preload force, and more blood's going to have a greater preload force. And the way your heart deals with that is, number one, it's going to stretch, and it's going to eject two-thirds of whatever volume of blood is in the heart. That is because as the heart stretches, there's going to be a stronger contraction. And this has to do with the association of the thick myosin and the thin actin in your sarcomeres of your striated muscle and cardiac muscle. Under normal conditions, there's somewhat of an overlap. And that overlap is not going to be as efficient as you see in our skeletal muscle. And so there's not going to be an optimal number of cross bridges formed at rest, so you're going to have an average contraction. Versus when you preload the ventricles with more blood and you stretch the heart and you stretch those myofibrils, they're going to stretch to the point that more cross bridges can form and therefore you're going to have a stronger, more long duration contraction and you can eject more blood. So right now, sitting and listening to this, you can eject two-thirds, and maybe your end diastolic volume is 100 mils. Well, if you're doing exercise and you have a greater venous return of 150 mils, you're going to eject two-thirds of 150 mils, which is more of your stroke volume, and that's going to lead to a higher cardiac output. Now, that's, that's, a, that's very simplified over what we have seen before, but this is a link to a video. I've got this posted in our news on D2L, so please go there and watch this video about cardiac stretch and increased stroke volume. Now, here's a big fancy word, inotropic agents. Inotropic refers to agents that are going to increase the ability of the heart to contract. And the way many of these inotropic agents work is they affect calcium levels. And like we talked about the overlap of the myofibrils altering the number of cross bridges that can form, calcium presence is also going to impact the number of cross bridges that, can, can, that form in our sarcomeres of cardiac muscle. So positive agents that can lead to greater calcium availability and increased stroke volume, epinephrine, norepinephrine, that's sympathetic, thyroid hormone, again, all about increasing metabolism, and negatively speaking, you can have electrolyte imbalances like dehydration that can often lead to a lower stroke volume, and you know that, that's going to be a problem because you need to move blood to try to get your fluid more balanced, especially to your muscles. When you dehydrate, electrolytes are more, more of a problem uh, for your heart necessarily than just for your skeletal muscle. You experience the cramps more often, but your heart is also having to work harder and be faster to offset this lack of availability of increasing stroke volume. Now we mentioned the afterload force, the difference in moving fluid through a pipe or a tiny diameter straw. The vessels that your heart is pumping blood into, these vessels can dilate and become wider or they can constrict and become more narrow. The resistance of those arteries, that's gonna determine the force with which you're pushing against. So you've got the preload, the amount of blood you need to move and how quickly can you move it through these vessels? And the diameter is going to inversely correlate with the amount of blood that you can move. Now, this can be controlled physiologically with either dilated or constricted vessels, but in pathologic situations, you can have atherosclerosis that have these cholesterol plaques that build up they, they also will collect cells and they become really hard. It, it's historically been known as hardening of the arteries. But what it does is it narrows the diameter of your vessels, thus increasing the resistance, increasing this afterload force, which causes your heart to work harder and it's 
it's less able to move the same volume of blood. So this is a major problem. Now, this atherosclerosis is a problem in a lot of places, but it's mostly uh, identified earliest if you have blockages in your coronary arteries, especially the left anterior descending. That's the widowmaker. That's when you have the, the major massive heart attacks that you really don't recover from. So now as we come to the end of our discussion of, of cardiac and heart, we're going to look at sort of diagnostic testing equipment, and these are called electrocardiograms, electrocardiographs, excuse me. And these are going to detect the electrical activity of your cardiac muscles and give you an idea of the health and the pace that's going on inside your body. These electrical signals can be detected on the surface of the skin. Of course, they start in the SA node. They flow along your cells. They're relayed from one to another through those gap junctions, and that propagates along the plasma membranes of these muscle cells. And then we can detect them on the surface of the skin with various electrodes. Now, this used to be called EKG because it was developed in Germany. And in Germany, the letter K is the first letter in cardiac. So that's why it was EKG. And I think more established now is the use of the term ECG. So as we look at the stages of our ECG, there are going to be three main stages that we look at. This is going to be essentially 1, 3B, and 5, as you see in the numbered graph here. Number 1 is the P wave. And this electrical activity you see in this change in the graph is from atrial depolarization. So that depolarization wave that changes the membrane potential of those cells that is going to cause the P wave to occur, and that is what stimulates the atria to contract and undergo systole. Now, the next major wave that we have is the QRS, and this is dealing with the ventricle. But the uh, time between the end of the P and the beginning of the QRS, this is referred to as the PQ segment. And you see this plateau. Well, this is going to be the plateau of that cardiac muscle cycle with the potassium and the calcium. And this is going to be a time when the cardiac muscle in the atria are, are being able to contract and then relax. Now, remember, we've got the pause between the atrial contraction and that stimulation to the ventricles because of the AV node and the sending of that message through the AV bundle. And so our ventricles are next to undergo depolarization, and that is our QRS wave or QRS complex. And it's in this QRS complex, and you can see how much larger it is. That's because there's many more muscle cells in the ventricle than you find in the atria. So the ventricular depolarization during the QRS, that is going to be the signal for our ventricles to contract, followed by the next intervening segment before we get to the final wave. And this is the ST segment. Segments are between the waves. And this is going to be a time where the cardiac muscles contract and then relax. That flat line is also the plateau, again, with the potassium and the calcium. But this ST segment is also diagnostically important because any change, either an elevation or a depression in the ST segment, does indicate that patient has most likely had or is having a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So the ST segment for cardiologists is very diagnostic when you look at your ECG of a patient. Then finally, the last bump of our cardiac cycle, this ECG cycle. This is the T wave and it's ventricular repolarization. 
you can see in that PQ segment, that's atrial repolarization. You don't really see anything going on because there's not a whole lot of cells there. You see how small the P wave is compared to the T. Well, the I'm sorry, the P wave is to the QRS. But in this cycle, the ventricle is repolarizing. And this is going to be a time where the ventricles are preparing for the next cycle so they can undergo that stimulation one more time. And again, this is repeating about every eight-tenths of a second. Now, as we look at some standard ECGs, you're going to see this, this graphical form. And each one of these boxes and lines, it's going to be equidistant. So you can actually determine a rate by looking at these graphical lines. But this is a normal rhythm, and again, it is controlled by the sinoatrial node, so it's referred to as sinus rhythm. As you follow along, you can see the P wave, the QRS complex, the T wave, and you can see how this cycle repeats itself fairly regularly. So this is a pretty good sinus rhythm for this particular patient. Now again, our normal rate is 75 beats a minute on average. But sometimes you may have patients that have a slower heart rate. And if that rate is below 60 beats a minute, that is referred to as bradycardia. But if you look, you can still see a P, QRS, and a T. There's nothing wrong with our cycle. This is sinus bradycardia, and it's absolutely normal. In fact, when you sleep, your heart slows down. And if it falls below 60, then you have bradycardia. But it's physiologically normal and sinus bradycardia. If you, if you try to go up a flight of stairs and your heart won't increase, that, that's going to be a, a different kind of bradycardia, and that's one thing and you need to see a physician if your heart just won't speed up. And speaking of speeding up, your heart does speed up. In fact, if you run up a flight of stairs, I know certainly if I do, my heart's going to speed up. And if it goes up to 100 beats a minute, we've got sinus tachycardia. Normal increase in your heart rate to increase your cardiac output and supply the blood needed to your muscles that are very active. So sinus tachycardia, and you can see how many more beats a minute we're going to have versus our sinus rhythm. But again, tachycardia is not going to always be physiological. There are instances when people's heart will just take off for no reason at all. They're sitting doing nothing and the heart will just, just race. Sometimes 150, 180, 200 beats a minute. That is a different kind of tachycardia that's clinically uh, important to get that checked out. Now, one of the types of tachycardia that you do not want to experience is called ventricular tachycardia or VTAC. Notice we don't see sinus in front of this. Ventricular tachycardia is happening because there, there are ventricular cells that are deciding they want to do their own thing. That is called ectopic pacemaker activity. And this ventricular tachycardia is the ventricle is overriding the sinoatrial node and doing its very own thing. And this is a very, very dangerous situation. And one of the arrhythmias that you may encounter um, maybe too frequently than you would like to in a clinical setting. Now, some other arrhythmias before we get back to the ventricular tachycardia. If you get above 100, 200, and 300 beats a minute, that can be called flutter if it's coordinated. And you can see in this, this top graph, that's pretty coordinated, pretty consistent. But if you have rapid disorganized cardiac contractions, now we're talking about fibrillation. And at the bottom, you have an example of this discoordinated fibrillation. You can see the QRS cycles are not equally spaced at all. Now, with flutter and fibrillation, if it's in the atria, because you can have ectopic pacemaker activity in the atria as well, that's not going to be of such concern because, remember, only 20% of your end diastolic volume is contributed by atrial contraction. 
Remember, 80% goes in during the rapid filling period simply because the ventricles are under lower pressure and suck the blood down. So atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation that you'll almost always hear as AFib, they're not life-threatening and can largely be treated. But if we get to ventricular fibrilla, uh, fibrillation, this is a completely different ballgame. With V-fib, you have just a few minutes because blood's not moving when you're in V-fib. You're probably going to lose consciousness if you're in V-fib. You have to get the heart out of its cycle or else you're going to end up, uh, it's going to be a fatal condition. And we mentioned VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. That is usually followed by ventricular fibrillation, which is followed shortly by asystole, flatline. Remember, asystole, A or an means not or no. Systole meaning contraction. So this literally is talking about your heart not beating, your heart not moving blood. And one way clinically you can try to change this situation is with an electrical device called a defibrillator. And we have these on the walls in the building, the automatic electronic defibrillators. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to put all of the cardiac muscle cells into the same refractory period. You're trying to get them in the same position of the cardiac cycle in the hopes that once they come out of the refractory period, the SA node, <clears throat> the SA node will take over and you'll have a normal sinus, sinus rhythm again. But here you can see V-fib. So we saw VTAC, then we get V-fib, and then we get a flat line. This is the most serious of our cardiac arrhythmias. Now, I want to leave you with this one. This one is pretty new to me, and I learned this because my son, who is a soldier in, in uh, Okinawa, he ended up having some arrhythmias, some palpitations, pre, uh, PVCs, preventricular contractions. And when he went to the, the doctors to find out what was going on, his ECG had this shoulder, and you can see this right at the beginning of the QRS wave. That is clinically called the delta wave, and it's diagnostic for Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And in this syndrome, you have abnormal conductive pathways that cause your cardiac cycle to get out of whack. And so in the lower picture, what you can see is some, some imaging that was done during his procedure, which is cardiac ablation. And all of the green dots and especially the red dots, that is where a probe was placed and they used ultrasonic sound waves to basically cauterize this area of tissue to try to block the conductive pathway that was sending the aberrant signal. Well, this was probably a year to year and a half ago, and I'm happy to report that as of January of this year, he was off all his physical limitations and back to perfectly normal duty.